welcome to episode number two of the Backup Punter Podcast. We have made it past the pilot, not canceled yet, and I'm thankful that you are here for another one. My name is Keegan Matheson. You can find us on Twitter and Facebook at the Backup Punter. Visit at the Backup Punter dot com. We are back again, and from now on, this will be a little closer to our regularly scheduled day. I think the Backup Punter podcast will come to you in around Tuesday or Wednesday from now on out. And we're going to get to uh, quite a few things this week. Mainly, we're going to talk about concussions in the NFL. Call it the crisis, call it the situation, call it the dilemma, call it what you want. We're going to talk about that in depth, what I think about the future of concussions in the league, what I think is the truth about concussions in the league, and at the end of that discussion, I'm going to give you one simple way that I think the NFL can change the culture around concussions for free just by changing a word, how I think they can really change that. Later on in the show, we're going to talk about a few aging quarterbacks in the league who are finding themselves very strangely in the middle of either trade conversations or conversations about drafting their replacement. And I'm talking about the 36-year-old Drew Brees, 35-year-old Tony Romo entering the season, and the 33-year-old Philip Rivers in San Diego. So a little later in the show, we'll get to them and talk about, is it a good idea to draft a young quarterback right now? Are they going to look for that Favre into Rodgers phenomenon that Green Bay got so lucky with? Or are they going to ride with what they have for a little bit longer and burn all the oil they have? But first, just a couple little news bits from the last couple of days. The NFL has handed down some punishment in two sort of controversial cases. First off, the Atlanta Falcons have been hit with a $350,000 fine and docked a fifth-round pick. That's a number five-round pick in 2016 for a, a false crowd noise scandal. Now, what happened is a staff member of the Falcons named Roddy White, now that's not the receiver, just a coincidentally named staff member, had been heading up a, you know, by himself, this wasn't under the team direction, thankfully, but by himself he'd been adding fake crowd noise to the sound when they played home games, thus making it harder for the opposing offense to communicate. That's a big no-no, as you can assume. So $350,000 fine, that's a drop in the bucket. That doesn't matter. Fifth round pick, that's when it gets serious. Teams don't want to lose a draft pick. I don't care if it's a seventh round pick or a 20th round pick. They don't want to lose that. And I feel badly because Arthur Blank, the owner of the Falcons, he's one of the real good guys in this league. He's one of the guys that, you know, at least on a surface level, comes off like he really cares, really cares about the community around him. And, and he came out and he he expressed his embarrassment in in this entire situation. But the the employee has been fired. The fine's been handed down. Now, also, Cleveland, Cleveland Browns, as part of TextGate, because if something happens, we have to put the word gate on it, because creativity is just thriving today. So in TextGate, Cleveland Browns were fined $250,000 for their GM, Ray Farmer, who's a great GM, only 40 years old, but he got, you know, he stepped in the wrong thing here. Texting assistant coaches on the sideline during the game, another big no-no. Again, $250,000, that won't hurt the Browns. And they were not Dr. Draft Pick. Ray Farmer was suspended for the first four games of this upcoming season. Really, guys, that does not matter. He's going to be with the team through the draft, through the rest of free agency, all the way up to opening day. So he's going to set the 53-man roster. And then he'll take the first month of the season off. And the Browns will have a plan in place. But during that first month of the season, it'll really only be waiver wire transactions. They're not going to be negotiating a contract with Ray Farmer sitting on the bench. They're not going to be trading Johnny Manziel when Ray Farmer leaves the office. Nothing crazy will happen there. So that's about it for news over the past few days. Now let's get right to concussions. And I want to spend quite a while on concussions today because this is a big, big, big issue. Probably the most important issue in the NFL today. And the story has died down since Chris Borland's retirement just a couple weeks ago. And, of course, since this is the NFL, two weeks is an eternity, so the story has almost died off. 
You know, this happens all the time in the NFL. Whether it was with you know with Ray Rice, Adrian Peterson, Greg Hardy, some of those domestic violence situations. For a couple weeks, the rioters are at the fence with pitchforks, rightfully so. But then there's a next story. There's a next story. The Chris Borland news is getting buried by you know the upcoming NFL draft, free agency. In the NFL, things get buried very quickly. And that makes Roger Goodell one damn happy man. And it probably is with this, too. Now, Chris Borland, as you all know, 24-year-old inside linebacker with the San Francisco 49ers. If you look back to the 2014 draft and ask every GM for one player they wish they'd drafted, you're going to get about half of those GMs will say Chris Borland. And this is kind of you know the blanket term, tough to quantify, but he's just a true football player. Hard tackler, he can cover, great inside linebacker, and he was really destined to take over that defense with Patrick Willis also retiring from inside linebacker. 24 years old, lots of money in his future, retired. Now, it was very clear that he had done his research. Borland is an intelligent young man. He'd spoken to doctors. He'd spoken to former players. He'd traveled to a couple different places through the country. And he'd spoken to people who, who had played the game. And that's important because young players are now aware of concussions. The NFL is done hiding it. They've been, you know, whether you want to say they've been caught in their lies, they've been exposed, however you want to frame that, the information's out now. And with today's media, the effects of concussion have really come out. Since we know the effects of concussion, how they can lead to CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, we'll call it. If there's a doctor out there, you can correct me of how wrong I said that. But this degenerative brain disease, brain trauma, how that's been affecting players. We know now that this is linked to the deaths of several NFL players. If you haven't watched yet the documentary League of Denial, the NFL's Concussion Crisis. I know in Canada it's on Netflix, probably in, in America too. If not, you can find it online. You need to watch it. It focuses on the concussion crisis over the past few years, but also you know, both sides of it, on the medical side. focuses quite heavily on Dr. Bennett Omalu. He was a, a doctor in Pittsburgh who came across a couple brains of former Pittsburgh Steelers who had died. And he said, well, something's wrong here. This is CTE. And that, re that really started to, you know, to sound the alarms. This was, you know, over 10 years ago now. The focus then shifts to Dr. Anne McKee, a doctor in Boston with the Center for the Study of Traumatic Encephalopathy. She started that center, and they study brains of deceased NFL players. At the time of this documentary a couple years ago, they'd been having an extremely high rate of success finding CTE in the brains of deceased NFLers. As of September 30th of this past year, 2014, they'd studied 79 brains. 76 of them tested positive for CTE. 76 of 79. It's been a long time since I took a math course, but that's at least over 50%. Now, when this Chris Borland news came out, it fired up the debate between football people and what they want to call anti-football people. And in the, the couple days after the Chris Borland announcement, the news, Twitter comment sections were an absolute wasteland because there was no in-between. And the unfortunate truth with situations like this, with sports media, is that when there's a big news story, especially if it's something that stretches outside of the sport, like, like concussions, they're a sport issue, but they're, they're a human issue. Reporters, people inside the game, will use this as a soapbox moment to stand up and say, I'm right about this. And more importantly, you are wrong about this. You see this every day in baseball, but it happens in football coverage very often. And the thing that I noticed right off the bat, the moment Chris Borland retired, people were rushing 
to minimize this. Similar to the way that you know, the NFL very vocally, very publicly tried to downplay the research of Dr. McKee, Dr. Amalu. They published in medical journals calling out their research, trying to falsify it. In that same way, the days following the Borland decision, there were many people, not just NFL media, people from inside NFL franchises, saying, oh, here comes the anti-football crowd again. Oh, here they are. Now that the anti-football crowd finally has a reason to poke their head up out of their hole, here they are. Being anti-football is not the issue here. I was part of the crowd that people were referring to as anti-football. And I remember reading that in a comment section that, you know, I was reading an article that took a similar stance to what I believe in, and there were comments saying, oh, you're anti-football, you're anti-football. And I was reading it, and I thought, come on. I'm wearing an NFL licensed shirt from my desk. I can see NFL licensed this and that. When I turn around, I see my Green Bay Packers ownership certificate on the wall. It's been a lot of years since I spent less than 10 hours watching NFL football every Sunday. I'm not anti-football. Am I pro-brain health? Yes. Lock me up. Straight jacket. Right now. I'm in favor of brain health. And it blew my mind how some people were reacting to this. Now, I expected the general reaction of, oh, Chris Borland, he's, he's a wimp. He's weak. Chris Borland is a blank. Insert whatever bad word you want there. I expected that. There's still kind of the gladiator, bonehead mentality. Fine. But what really surprised me was people who are in the position to influence others' opinions really taking this stance. And the issue is that to prove themselves right, to put themselves on a pedestal, to put themselves up just arrogantly in a way that really rubs me the wrong way, they were kind of making the argument about other things. They were going on tangents. And it wasn't about who was right. It was about who was loudest, of course. But at several different points, I'd see tweets from people saying, well, you know, look at this upcoming NFL draft. There's no shortage of people trying to get us to come to their pro days. Everyone still wants into this league. That is not what this is about. The NFL is plagued by something called recency bias. Now, if you read the backuppunter.com, I've touched on recency bias a couple times before. What recency bias means is giving too great of a weight, too great of an importance to very recent happenings instead of looking at a big picture. And just for a, a simple example, you see this all the time in the NFL. Say there's a, a running back who's produced 1,000-yard seasons over and over and over. They've been a great player for a team. They go down with a hamstring injury for a couple of weeks. In steps a rookie and has a 100-yard game. He's the new starter. It's a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately type of league. And even more, it's a what-have-you-done-for-me-the-past-week type of league. Now, that's fine when it's on the football field. That's all good and well. I don't care about that. But when they're talking about an issue like this, that cannot be the mentality. And when people look at it like that, they're failing to look at the long circular circular sorry cycle that the NFL runs on and it's a matter of influence chris borland's decision is not going to reach down and make leonard williams randy gregory vic beasley a prospect getting drafted in a month for millions of dollars it's not going to make that guy walk away from the game this is about pop warner football this is about high school football this is about kids who are 8 10, 12 years away from the NFL. People are refusing to look back and see how far influence goes. And you see this in football all the time. Look back when Michael Vick, 10, 15 years ago, when Michael Vick was dominating college football. He was this new quarterback. There had been scrambling quarterbacks before, but Michael Vick was just this exciting new thing no one had seen before. Kids that are 8, 10, 12 years old, they say, I want to be like Michael Vick. So, a decade down the line, you see a lot of scrambling quarterbacks. That's not a coincidence. Then I look to the tight end position. I wrote the other day about how there aren't enough good tight ends in the draft to make up for the, the need in the NFL. Everyone wants a Gronkowski. Everyone wants a Graham. 
Well, Jimmy Graham, Rob Gronkowski, those type athletes, those stem back to Tony Gonzalez. Tony Gonzalez was dominating football before the tight end position was really, really the, you know, the sexy, the niche position. Big bodies, instead of looking at defensive end or, or you know, defensive line, offensive line, maybe they'll say, hey, I want to go where the money is now. Tight ends are getting paid. Rob Gronkowski, Jimmy Graham, two of the most dominant, popular players in this league now. I guarantee you, in the next five, six years, you're going to see a lot more big, athletic tight ends. This applies to concussions very much. Because it goes back to kids who are 8, 10, 12 years old. And the important thing that all this is doing is it's educating them on what, you know, what the hell is a concussion. Because that is a new concept. And when I think of concussions, I think of one I got myself. And it came... Oh, when I was, we'll say I was 10, 12 years old. I, I, oh, a good, you know, over 10 years ago now, well over. Playing at a hockey tournament, playing goaltender, and an opponent came in off the wing, took a shot, and hit me in the helmet. Now, after the surprise of actually making a save wore off, I realized, hey, my head feels a bit weird. It wasn't a, a very hard shot, but it hit right off the crown of the helmet. And I began to feel wobbly, the lights in the arena began to bother me, but in my mind, oh, I just, I got my bell rung. This is like you see in a cartoon where someone hits their head and little animated images spin around their head, and they just need a minute. Don't remember the rest of the game, next thing I remember I was at the hospital, sick, couldn't look at the lights, was confused, didn't know I'd been playing hockey. And before any of you say, oh, that's not football, you don't play that's not what I'm getting at here. I'm getting at the general issue of young people and concussions. Because when a young kid gets hit in the head, that's what they think. Oh, I just got my bell rung. You know, oh, no, I just, you know, I'm just a bit woozy. Just shake it off. Thankfully, that's changing. The culture is changing down through the ranks. A lot of that comes from parents, coaches, play some very important roles. But it's difficult for kids because if they break their arm, they look down and say, hey, my arm isn't exactly straight right now. There's probably an issue. If they twist their ankle, then they step on their ankle and they say, Oh, that hurts. I can't bear weight on my ankle. Those are obvious. You can see them physically. They exist. If they cut themselves, they bleed. They see that. With a concussion, you can stand two players together. One can have a severe concussion. The other won't. You have no way of telling. You cannot see a concussion from the outside, unless you're a doctor in close, looking at the eyes and testing. But you know what I mean. So that's important for kids. And we have a generation of young football players now that are going to grow up in a, you know, a concussion era, if you want to call it that. In an era where they're educated about concussions from a young age. Where they're made to fear concussions because they see what's happening to some of their idols. And that is very important, because when parents see that, there are going to be a lot of parents holding kids out of football now. Maybe they'll let them play football up until high school, but they'll cap it there. And that's okay. That's a, an issue that I've struggled with, because I'm usually very stubborn with things like this. You know, with, um, you know it, it frustrates me when I see parents kind of wrapping their kids in bubble wrap and not wanting to let them you know, grow up quickly or, you know, or do anything that might make them scrape a knee. You know, let the kids scrape their knee. They'll know not to do it type thing. But with this, this is so different. If I'm a parent and my kid goes into football and they do scrape their knee, if they fall and sprain their wrist, that would break my heart. You don't want your kid to be hurt. But something like that is something that you expect when they go into football. By no means am I going to be standing there saying, hey, that'll, that'll toughen you up. That's, that's stupid. Come on. But if they hurt, you know, hurt an arm, hurt an ankle, scrape a knee, then you're thinking that's what comes with football. It's too bad it happened, but it's okay. But if I'm a parent and my child is getting a concussion playing football, that worries the hell out of me because that could mess with their future. And I want to be careful not to speak about concussions as certainties here. You know, the brain is the last frontier. I am the last person on Earth who knows the intricacies of that. 
Not every concussion is going to lead you down a road of alcoholism and depression, despair, ending in your demise. That's not how this works. But it does not help. And when you see what's happening at the NFL level with some of these players later in life, that should rightfully be scaring some parents. You don't want your child's future impacted. A scraped knee won't do a thing for your child's future. Put a Band-Aid on it. Bring them to Dairy Queen. Bring them for a burger. Everything's okay. But a concussion, that's worrying. And especially with the media coverage being given to these players I just mentioned later in life. And when I wrote an article the day after Chris Borland made his decision, I didn't have to look back far to see a lot of tragedy with people diagnosed with CTE. Dave Dewerson, 2011, great player, was found dead with a gunshot wound to his chest. And he'd left a note for his family asking that they donate his brain to CTE research. Asking that they do because he knew something was wrong. He tested positive. Junior Seau in 2012, found dead, gunshot wound to his chest. 43 years old, one of the all-time greats on defense, left football and his life fell apart, lost his money, he was drinking, he was depressed, positive for CTE. Jovan Belcher in something that I, I can't believe we still don't talk about, 25 years old in 2012, kills the mother of his child, his girlfriend, then drives to the Kansas City Chiefs facility and in front of Chiefs personnel from the coaching staff in the parking lot, takes his own life with a gun. He tested positive for CTE. Is a concussion in the NFL linked to this with a straight line? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. There are other factors, and that's why we shouldn't just jump right on Dr. McKee's research and say, this is the gospel, this is fact. There's other factors. There's more research to be done, of course. But... If Dave Dorson, Junior Seau, Jovan Belcher, many others, if they had not have played NFL football, would they still be alive? Would Jovan Belcher's child have parents? Would Junior Seau's kids have a father? That's a, that's a terrifying question. And when you step back from all of this, forget that you're an NFL fan, step back and look at the NFL from a distance, just as, as a thing. Make the NFL into a thing and look at it. How is this something that's just going on? How is this being allowed to happen? Well, because the NFL is one of the most powerful organizations in America. That's got a lot to do with it. But each one of these stories are followed up by another story a week or two later that sweeps it under the rug, unfortunately. Now, with the, the conversation kicked back into gear by Chris Borland, hopefully this will keep the conversation alive a bit longer. But it's really amazing when you try to digest what is happening in the NFL with concussions. Because it's, you know, it's something that's hard to understand. The concussion, the lawsuits that are involved, it gets overwhelming for a fan. But step back and look at it. People are dead. Would they be alive if it were not for concussions? If they had have had all the information about CTE, if they had have known, would they have kept playing? Most of the time, yes, they probably would have. But they didn't know that it was going to lead to this. And that's scary. Now, I said when we started this that I wanted to offer what I think is a step in the right direction for concussions. Sure as hell isn't a solution, but it's a step in the right direction to creating a culture around it. And I think the concussions need to be rebranded. I don't think that we should call them concussions anymore when it comes to football. And I'll tell you why. Like I was saying earlier, if a player breaks their leg, it's called a broken leg. When you see it on your fantasy football roster, or you see a story on NFL Network, or you see it on the bottom ticker scrolling across Sports Center, it will say, you know, Adrian Peterson, out six to eight weeks in brackets, broken leg. If Adrian Peterson pulls a hamstring, Adrian Peterson is out three to four weeks 
in brackets, pulled hamstring. The names that we give to those injuries mean exactly what happened. But then you see Adrian Peterson is out undisclosed time in brackets, concussion. Now that's the medical term. That's, that's the correct term given to it. That's not what I'm arguing. But we live in a world where we need to apply soft, gentle, pillowed, silky names to things. And that isn't right. So why don't we call concussions brain trauma or head trauma? If a young player sees Adrian Peterson is out with a concussion, they think, oh, damn, I like Adrian Peterson. If they see Adrian Peterson is out with brain trauma, they think, oh, my God, brain trauma. That sounds bad. Well, that's what it is. That's what a concussion is, trauma to the brain. But when we call it a concussion, we're kind of wearing, you know, we're wearing lab gloves to touch it. We're standing and we're watching it from behind a glass door. We're not getting dirty with concussions. In a large part, that's because they're scary, and that's okay. But I think that if the NFL, if football started discussing these as brain injuries, brain trauma, head trauma, then that would help to change the culture of this. Now, this is something that I'm really interested to hear what you all think about. Because this has become one of those hot-button topics that has developed into some very passionate, uh, maybe we'll call it passionate because that's a nice word for uh, angry debate. <laughs> but what do you think about this? Do you think that we're going to see more players walking around in the next couple of years? Do you agree with me that this is going to be more of a long-term growth through the game? Where somewhere there's a parent that's holding the next Barry Sanders, the next Tom Brady out of football? Is that what's going to happen? Or am I wrong? Is this going to keep rolling on? Is the NFL too powerful to bring down? I'm afraid that might be the answer. But tell me what you think. Reach out to us at the Backup Punter on Twitter. Like us on Facebook at the Backup Punter. TheBackupPunter.com. You can find that article on Chris Borland. It's from the day that he announced his retirement. Comment there. Tell me what you think about this. Because that's what this entire story is about. Public perception. Culture change. Do we understand concussions? Do we appreciate them? Do we fear them? And what will our fear of concussions make us do? So that's enough in concussions. Let's talk about some football on the field here. Drew Brees, Tony Romo, Philip Rivers. How much time do they have left? So it's that time of year again with the draft approaching. Speaking of recency bias, everyone wants the new shiny thing. Even though the thing they might already have is probably better. We see that with Drew Brees, Tony Romo, Philip Rivers. Around a couple of those names, there's some trade speculation. Around a couple of those names, there's questions about, you know, how much time do they have left? Let's start with Drew Brees, who's 36. That is not young. Drew Brees has operated at such a, a high level through his career that you, you lose track of his age. He's never looked old until this past year where his arm, eh, it was a little iffy. A lot of that com came from the offense, too. The team as a whole was poor. He's 36 years old. He's due to count $26.4 million against the cap in 2015. Season after that, in 2016, he's going to count $27.4 million against the cap. Now, the Saints, they aren't a rich team right now. They're up against the cap. They're stuck in this weird, poorly planned realm of wanting to still compete, but also wanting to get cheaper and younger. That's not a good place to be. Are they going to want to keep that contract around? Do they want him to be playing when he's 37, 38? Do they think he can still do it? 
Well, the the things that the New Orleans Saints are doing, they're not making sense right now. Sean Payton's come out and said that, you know, we're, we're going to go through an identity change. We We want this team to win without having to score 40 points, which is a good strategy for any team. They don't want this to be the Drew Brees show like it has been, where the Saints are winning games 42 to 39. Unfortunately, the Saints are really lacking on defense, and they've lost some pieces already. Now, they've got some you know, some great pieces still around, Junior Gallette, Kenny Vaccaro, Jarris Bird. But Rob Ryan needs to make that thing work. Now, I understand that they don't want it to be all Drew Brees, but why are they taking away all of his weapons? Now, Brandon Cooks is coming back, I know, good for him. But they've traded away Jimmy Graham, his number one weapon, not to mention a guy that Drew Brees likes as a person a lot. They traded away Kenny Stills, great young receiver, I think he's 22, no more than 23, to the Miami Dolphins. Traded him away for a draft pick. He could be a 1,000-yard receiver this season, easily. He's gone. The Saints offensive line has some work to do. I'm not sure what they're doing there. They are putting Drew Brees in a position where he's going to have to do more than ever. That's what they're doing. This might not be a 40-point offense anymore, but if it's a 22-point offense, that has to be all Drew Brees. He's got to do a lot here. C.J. Spiller, Mark Ingram will help. But when that Saints defense allows early points, Saint, New Orleans isn't going to run their way back into a game. They're going to have to throw. When they get into the red zone, what are they going to do? They are going to miss Jimmy Graham in the red zone. Now looking to the draft, past Jameis Winston, past Marcus Mariota, what do you have? Well, you don't have much. Even Winston and Mariota are kind of inflated in their value due to their role as, you know, the number one, number two QBs in this class. So past them, you've got, you know, Bryce Petty out of Baylor, Garrett Grayson out of Colorado State, who's real you know, a real sleeper in this draft. Brett Hundley. I, I do love Bryce Petty out of Baylor. Hundley has the skills. Garrett Grayson, he does too. But these are all guys that are, are so unfinished. Do you know what you're getting? Especially a guy like Hundley. How is he going to transition over to the NFL? I really don't know. So the Saints need to make a choice here. Are they going to draft someone like a Bryce Petty? Might not be a bad idea. And try to develop him for two years behind Drew Brees? Maybe develop him for one year? Is that your best idea? Is that going to set you up for future success? That's a big risk. How will Drew Brees feel about that? I don't know. So maybe a later round prospect, mid-late round prospect, someone like Sean Mannion out of Oregon State. Brandon Bridge out of Southern Alabama. Big arm, raw prospect. Someone you might be able to develop. You know, as it stands right now, Drew Brees, he's more than just the face of the franchise. He's the face of a city. He is New Orleans athlete. This is more than just a football team. And despite his age at 36, you almost wish that the Saints could get him to restructure quite generously, but after all he's done for this team, I'm not sure if that's the best thing to go asking right now either. So I definitely see the Saints drafting a quarterback round two, maybe round three this year. But look back through the draft at the history of second-round quarterbacks, and you are going to see a laundry list of bad, bad, bad quarterbacks. If I'm not drafting a quarterback in the first round, I might be more tempted to wait till rounds three, four, and five, where you can get a guy who's, you know, he's just a quarterback. He doesn't have to be one of these scramblers, doesn't have to be one of these system quarterbacks who put up 100 touchdowns and two interceptions, but comes in and can't progress through reads to save his life. I'm looking right at you, Robert Griffin. You don't need that. If I were the Saints, I'd be grabbing a mid-round guy this year and seeing if Breeze can bounce back a bit. I'm not sure how late into his career he wants to play, but they'll have to figure that out soon. Now looking at Tony Romo, he's going to start the season 35 for the Dallas Cowboys. 
he's set to make $27.7 million against the cap this year. Big number this year. Then from 2016 to 2019, his cap number floats in between 17.6 and 22 million. Bounces back and forth in around there. There's a little relief at the end. I don't think he's as bonus heavy towards the end. So that contract might get a little easier to get out from under if they want. Now with Tony Romo, there's no talk of trading Tony Romo. No talk of getting rid of him like there might be with Drew Brees. The talk in Dallas is what's the next plan? What's after Romo? Because, you know, the, the Cowboys got very, not lucky because it was a great signing, but fans got lucky because they were given Romo as an undrafted free agent who just took the reins of this franchise. And Romo gets a hard time from fans, sometimes rightfully so, but, but this is a very good quarterback. You're, you don't just go out and get a, a quarterback better than Tony Romo in free agency. In free agency, you get guys like Josh McCown. You don't get Tony Romo's. He had a great year last year. And this team has been built to protect him. That offensive line is fantastic. And, you know, Romo's had some issues with injuries. He's one of the toughest guys in this league, but he's beaten up. So are they going to be you know, itching to move on from Romo? I don't think so at all. I really don't think so. And I don't know if the Dallas Cowboys are really in a mode right now to be developing a quarterback, you know? Are they more of a quick-fix team, or are they someone that's going to take a long-term project? And you can look at it from both sides. Jerry Jones was there when they took Romo as a, you know, undrafted free agent. Developed him. It's turned out damn good for them. Say what you want about Romo. He's a very good quarterback. And he's done very well in the Dallas market. Put some other quarterbacks in that Dallas Cowboys market, and they'll crumble. It's like putting someone in the Toronto Maple Leafs market or the New York Knicks market. It's not for everybody. Romo's handled it very well. What I see happening here, keep in mind that, to that um, sorry, Jerry Jones, he's 72 years old. He's already kind of started to hand off management of the franchise in terms of football operation. Jerry Jones, Tony Romo is his boy. It's his guy. I see Jerry Jones wanting to leave the Dallas Cowboys with their next QB of the future. Maybe that would be his kind of last move, and he can leave the franchise and say, there you go. You know, he'd still own it, but but then he could step back and say, there, I've given you your, your franchise QB to take the reins after Romo. So take Johnny Manziel. <laughs> Maybe not Manziel. But take whoever this is and carry on without me. Maybe when Tony Romo gets to 37, 38, Jerry Jones in his mid-70s, I could see him making a big splash. I see Jerry Jones being more of a, you know, trade-up to get the top quarterback in the draft type of guy. But would it make sense to draft and develop right now? You bet it would. You've got a QB in his mid-30s? Get an arm in there. I don't care if it's a first-rounder or a seventh-rounder. Get an arm in there. If I'm a GM, I'm going to draft a quarterback in almost every draft. You never know what you're going to find in the 6th and 7th round. Now, perhaps the most interesting QB situation here comes with Philip Rivers, San Diego Chargers. Rivers is just 33 years old. He's set to make $17.4 million against the cap in 2015. Then in 2016, he's an unrestricted free agent. This situation has a lot of factors playing into it. The Chargers are holding a, a private workout with Oregon's Marcus Mariota April 15th before the draft, and they're going to have their big guys there. This isn't just to kick tires. They don't do this to waste time, fill a day, make a trip. That means there's interest in Marcus Mariota. Would they be bold enough to make a move up? Well, that would cost a lot. Any move up in the draft, say if they wanted to move to number two, Tennessee, that would probably cost them Philip Rivers as well to a QB needy team. I don't know about you, but I do not want to put Marcus Mariota in as my starter from day one. I want him to have a year to develop. So that complicates things. Ideally, the Chargers could keep Philip Rivers. They've said that they want him to retire a Charger. Kind of like Tony Romo, maybe Tony Romo light. You know, Philip Rivers, he has had some very good seasons. He's been above the league average, and he's one of those quarterbacks that fans get frustrated with 
rightfully so. They should get frustrated a lot of the time. But it's always the question of, you know, who are you going to do better? Who's going to get better? Just like Jay Cutler in Chicago. Like, oh, we need a new quarterback. Well, yes. But who is out there better than Jay Cutler? Who is out there better than Phillip Rivers? The Chargers, they're close to the playoffs now. Do they want us to take a small step backwards with Mariota, hoping to make a long-term gain, or do they see three, four, five more years out of Phillip Rivers? Now let's complicate this even a little more. Phillip Rivers is a family man, big family. He has hinted that he might not want to move his family if a team goes to Los Angeles. Right now, the San Diego Chargers are a front-runner to be moved to Los Angeles. All signs are pointing to at least one team in Los Angeles by 2016. Would Phillip Rivers want to sign an extension with the Chargers if he thought there was a chance he'd have to play in Los Angeles? I don't know about that. It's late in his career. He's someone who is very, you know, he, he puts a great value on life outside of football. He's a fiery competitor, loves the game, but he recognizes that there is life outside it. He's made a ton of money already. This is a guy that could surprise you and retire early, to be honest. I don't think that'll happen, but he's the type of guy that could do that. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure if if this is going to work out for him in San Diego. I really hope it does, because anyone who listens to this podcast, reads the blog, you know that I love it when a great player just sticks with a team for his career and doesn't go somewhere else to break down for a couple seasons. So the Chargers are doing him saying all the right things, that they're in contract talks, this and that. But this comes down to Phillip Rivers. The ball is in his court right now, and that's good for him. So that's a look at some of the QB situations entering April here. We've got one month until the NFL draft. One month until we see where Marcus Mariota goes. It looks like Jameis Winston will be to the Bucks. That's pretty safe. Leave that there. But Marcus Mariota is really turning into the wild card here. And it's almost like he's a he's a better version of uh, you know, a Teddy Bridgewater prospect who slid all the way to the bottom around one to the Vikings. But Teddy Bridgewater, you know, he was projected by many to go higher, and he slid and he slid and he slid. This part of the draft process, like I've said before, it's not about finding players that you love. It's about taking the players you already love and poking holes in them. If there's a team out there in the NFL that likes Marcus Mariota, they've figured that out already. No one's waking up on April 10th and saying, Hey, have you guys heard of Marcus Mariota, Oregon, Heisman winner? Should we look at him? That's not happening. At this point, teams have their boards pretty well set, and they're going through and they're looking. And they're saying, If we pick this guy, why won't he succeed? Teams are doing that to Marcus Mariota now. That might not go very well for him. I can still see him being the number two overall pick because it only takes one team to want to trade up. But his stock might slip a little bit. I read the latest NFL.com mock today where he was going, I think, 17th to the Chargers. Will he slip that far? I doubt it. But if a team moves up to grab him, don't be surprised if they are the powder blue and yellow San Diego Chargers. So we'll be back next week. Tuesday or Wednesday, we'll figure it out. If you prefer a day, let us know. We need to pick a solid date. And I think next week we will do a mock draft special for Episode 3 of the Backup Punter Podcast. I've posted, I think, three mock drafts up to this point. And now it's not as much about scouting prospects. It's about keeping your ear to the ground and seeing who likes what prospect. So hopefully we can get a little more clarity as we get closer here. So next week early, we'll do a mock draft special. Touch on any news that you have along the way. And most importantly, like I said last week, any questions, comments, polite remarks that you might have, feel free to send them to thebackuppunter.com, Twitter and Facebook at thebackuppunter. Follow along. There's new content each and every day. Today we had a, a scouting profile of Eric Flowers up. I think we're just you know, we're in between 30 and 40 prospect profiles we've done so far. Hit the home page up in your right corner along the top horizontal menu. You'll see a bar that says 2015 NFL Draft Prospect Profiles. 
jump in there, learn a little bit about prospects, why you should love them, why you should hate them. And next week, we will go over each and every one. So send in your questions. We'll get to them on the show next week. My name is Keegan Matheson. It has been, is, and will continue to be. And I hope you're back with us next week for episode number three of the Backup Punter podcast from thebackuppunter.com. Have a great week, everybody. <laughs>